you help me thank the choir and the worship team this morning. Thank you guys for leading us in worship. Grateful to be in a place where we can call on the name of the Lord. He is our shield. He is our helper. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. We're talking about this sermon series called Turning Points. And it is heavy on my heart, the fact that God is at our doorstep, as church, knocking to see if we let him in. But sometimes, sometimes we're just too busy having too much fun inside, and he's out there knocking. But if anyone opens the door, he will come in. You have fellowship with us. But should Jesus be knocking until we answer the call? Shouldn't he already be here? Shouldn't he be the one in the middle of the church that mean, gives meaning to our gathering? Shouldn't he be the one that we gather for? First Peter 2, 1 through 12 says, So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. May God bless his word. So this is now the third time that Peter has told us that we are to behave and to live as sojourners and exiles. People that do not belong in this world because they belong to Christ. You know, sometimes though, even though God is calling, and we've seen in chapter 1 already that God has called us to salvation, and God has also called us to sanctification. Even though God has clearly called us out of the world to receive the gift of eternal life, and even though this gift of eternal life is started right here, right now, as we become more and more like Jesus, sometimes we're hard of hearing. And sometimes there's so much noise around us that we don't really hear, especially when we're in the midst of the storms of life. We had a storm last night, right? It is really nice when you are in a nice, dry, comfortable place, just hearing the, the rain, right, and the thunder every once in a while, whoosh, and it scares you a little bit, but you are so safe, tucked in, nice and cozy. If you can cruise through the storms of life like that, well, that's not too bad. But I'm sorry to tell you that that's not always the case. Many times the storms in our lives come, and we are not in a nice place. We're right in the middle of a storm, and sometimes the difficulty or the comforts of this world don't really let us hear the, vo the voice of Christ. But... God is not going to give up. God will always call us and remind us who we are in Christ. And Peter is coming again saying, guys, today is the day. 
when some of you are going to have to settle some things in your heart. And here's the question. What makes for a fulfilling life? Somebody said that until you find something that is worth living for, you're not truly living. I believe that's Martin Luther King who said that. Now, did he find something worth living and dying for? Do we? Because here's the thing, what Peter is telling these believers is telling them this because they were in a place where they were facing persecution. Some of them were losing their property. Some of them were losing their family members. Some of them were losing their friends. Some of them were losing their lives because people were saying all sorts of things against Christians. I'm glad things have changed now, right? Everything is good. Listen, sometimes, especially in the United States, when we start suffering a little bit for our faith, it's like, what? That's not what I signed for. So what do you sign up for? Peter is telling us that if you want to live for Christ, you got to get used to the fact that the world will reject you, that you are not going to fit here because you fit with him. You are an exile. You don't belong in this place. You have a higher calling. God has a bigger plan for you. God has an identity for you and me that is not defined by the fashions of this world, by how many people like you on Facebook, by how many subscribers you have in your podcast. Even this morning, as we had the storm, our internet was not working. Oh, no. Can we get anything done without the internet? No. The world's got to stop, right? We've got a good Bible. We've got a good Lord. The Holy Spirit indwells us. We're the people of God. Of course, we can be the church. Of course, now. If the internet, I don't know if it's working right now or not, but if you're at home and watching online, that's a great tool to have. We're so grateful for the tools, but they are just tools. They're not replacement for people. They're not replacement for the presence of God with his people. As imperfect as we are, God dwells in the praises of his people. So when you get out of your comfort to come and praise together in community, you're doing it because the Lord has told us that's how he's going to show up. So what does that have to do with Peter? Everything. Listen, I read an article last week. It's actually a report by the Pew Research Center. It is quite a report. And these people do intensive research on trends and what people really think. Or it's, it's, These are pollsters, but this, this is a really good research. And it's all about the views of modern Americans concerning the family. Did you know? Did you know that Americans are getting married later and later in life? In the 1950s, for men, the average age for marriageable men was 22.5 years, for women 20.1. In 2023, it's 30.2 years for men, 28.4 for women. And you know what? That's not always too bad, right? My grandmother got married when she was 13, and my grandfather was 22. Now, that's illegal now, okay? That's illegal now, but that was a long time ago. They had 15 children. They were married for life. Somehow, they made it work. But people are getting married later and later because they have more opportunities Mortality in the mother age is a lot higher than in middle ages, right? So you have more chances. There's medicine. There's all sorts of things. But the interesting thing that caught my eye is that some of those choices that people are making are actually being made because of the values that we're embracing. Not everything is because we live longer. Not everything is because we go to college. Not everything is because you want to have a better chance at life. Some of the things that we're adopting and that we're valuing are very different from what people value before, and even what Christians have valued traditionally. Right here on page 32 of this report, they're asking, what makes for a fulfilling life? I think it's worth reading in light of what we're going to see in Peter. So check this out. It says, when asked what it takes to lead a fulfilling life, the public prioritizes two things. First, job satisfaction and friendship over marriage and parenthood. Some 71% of all adults say having a job or career they enjoy is extremely or very important in order for people to live a fulfilling life. And 61% say having close friends is equally important. Only about one in four adults say having children, 26%, or being married, 23%, is extremely or very important in order to live a fulfilling life. A third say each of these is somewhat important, and 42 to 44 percent respectively say having children or being married is not too or not at all important. 
having a lot of money is viewed as extremely or very important for a fulfilling life by 24% of adults, while another 49% say this is somewhat important. About one in four adults, 27% say this is not too or not at all important. In conclusion, Americans see jobs and close friends rather than marriage and parenthood as highly important elements of living a fulfilling life. And when you dig deeper into young adults' conversations, why are you hesitant about marriage? Well, a common topic that comes over and over again is that I'm not ready for that kind of commitment. Marriage takes a big commitment, and we're not ready for that. And we're not ready for that because nowadays, actually, why would you want marriage when you can get all the benefits that marriage traditionally affords you, but you don't need to commit to it? You can live with somebody, right? Not a big deal. You don't need to be committed. You're just exploring to see if things work. Let me tell you this. Things are not going to work if you don't make them work the way God made them to work. You're shooting yourself on the foot. But, but well, kids are now an inconvenience. I'd rather have savings. I'd rather travel all over the world. I'd rather have a great career now. If you choose to be single, nothing wrong with that. Single, singleness is one of God's callings. In fact, Paul says, oh, just between you and I, it's going to be better if you're single. What does he know, right? If you're married, you know that whether you're single or married, the pathway of singleness through celibacy or marriage is a pathway of sanctification, not primarily to make you happy, but to make you holy. Um, boy, is it going to take a lot of work, right? No matter what. But here's, here's what's non-negotiable. You and I are being indoctrinated in a philosophy that puts human beings at the center of every possible pleasure and blessing without the commitment that it takes to make it work. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's raising kids, whether it's a church, whether it's with God, you can have your cake and eat it too, and you don't need anybody to share the cake. That's the point. And Peter is saying, that's not what God's calling is all about. A lot of Christians at church, hear me out, a lot of Christians at church, rather than committing to God when he calls, rather than committing to salvation, beginning with a covenant of repentance, saying, Lord, forgive my sins. You just want to play church. You just want to feel good. You want a religion that tells you some psychology. Give me two or three steps to fix this problem and I'll be good. Fix my marriage. Fix my kids. God, please fix my husband. If you fix my husband, I'll be fine. That's not how it works. The problem is you and I and our sin in our heart. If we're not saved... There's nothing good that will come out of our lives permanently and forever. But then if you're saved, now you, need, you and I need to be sanctified, need to be set apart, need to learn to live again. Oh my gosh, it takes so much work. I thought you said if, if I raise your, my hand and I say I believe, I'm saved. No, I didn't tell you if you said you believe. I told you you have to believe. It's very different to say that you believe and really believing. It's not just about what you say, it's about what you truly believe, whom you trust in. And that will result in good works and a life change in your life that looks more and more like Jesus Christ, sanctified. And then God saves the best for last. You and I are going to be sent. Sent? Sent where? I can barely come. You're going to send me where? Yeah, you're going to be sent just like Jesus to reach this world and make disciples and multiply disciple makers. You're going to be sent. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, here's my question for you. Are you willing to stop flirting with Jesus Christ? Oh, I like Jesus. He's a good guy. He's my homeboy, right? These shirts and all sorts of things. No, 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 no. Jesus doesn't want to be your homeboy. Jesus doesn't want to be a nice guy, a nice prophet. Jesus wants to be your Lord and Savior. And that's it. So you and I, you and I need to quit flirting with him. He doesn't need you to like him. He doesn't need you to approve of him. He wants you to follow him, but you're going to have to commit. If you want to enjoy your life without bothering about what Jesus wants, he's going to let you do that. But there's a very big cost to that. You can win the whole world and lose your soul. And then what good will that be? Jesus is after what matters most. And there are three things that matter to Jesus. And this is the cornerstone of this call that we'll talk about today. Your salvation, if you're not saved, you need to receive the gift of eternal life in his name. It's your sanctification, you need to understand that you've been set apart to live like him and for him. And then your mission, 
God is going to send you to be a blessing. So come back with me. We're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about ultimate commitment based on answering the ultimate questions. When philosophers talk about what gives meaning to life, what makes life fulfilling or meaningful, they always talk about answering the ultimate questions. What are the ultimate questions? The things that ground us on what life is all about, what truth is all about, what reality is all about. Questions like, who am I? My identity. Questions like, where do I come from? Where am I going? What am I here for? Those are some of the ultimate questions of existence. Is there a God? What is good? Is there evil? Those kind of things. Those are the things that really direct our values and that allow us to discern what matters most from what doesn't. You and I need to find something that is worth living and dying for. Let me just tell you this. There is no one, no one that has shown us what's most important, what's worth living and dying more, better than Jesus. Jesus gave his life for us, for our salvation, and he took it back on the third day so that we can share in his kingdom and his glory. Now, that's worth living and dying for. So, there are three things that Peter wants to tell us today. As we become more and more his followers, ultimate commitment to Jesus Christ demands that his followers do three things. And Peter gives us three illustrations. The first one is refine their test to feed on God's provision. Look at what it says in verse 1 again. 1 Peter 2, 1 says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Every one of these things right here is not God's will for our lives. What is malice? Malice is when we see others in the worst possible way and we make judgment calls on them on our mind and we don't give them the benefit of doubt. It's a predisposition to evil. It's a predisposition to do what is wrong. It's an inclination to do what is wrong, but also it's reading other people in the worst possible light. I shared with you before that my wife and I are going to counseling, right? This is a rhythm for the rest of our lives because we're going to need godly counsel from the body of Christ and each other to be able to be sanctified. That's part of our lives, guys. Exhortation and encouragement. I had an interesting session uh, this last week where we're talking about some conflict resolution stuff, blah, blah, blah. Things are going great. By the way, just in case you're curious, no, we're not in a crisis mode. The pastor is getting divorced. No, by God's grace, we're just growing in sanctification, okay? So if you have any doubts about what, what we're dealing with, come talk to me. I would love to tell you more. I'm going to bore you, but come talk to me, right? So, so anyway, but I'm just speaking for myself now, I'm, I, and I'm ready to get to the meat of the issue. Finally, I'm going to fix my wife. So the counselor looks at me and very gently, um, husband and wife couple, counseling ministers, uh, looks at me and says, I just sense this is a really good time for confession. I'm like, yes. I'm waiting to hear the apology, right? And the Lord just zooms in my heart and says, she's not talking about your wife. <laughs> what? I'm a pastor. Pastors, pastors are not wrong, right, Lord? Certainly not wrong. You know what I realized I struggled with? Brands can tell you. I already confessed to Brands. So I'm going to wait until Brands preaches to be more candid, right? I realized I struggled with unforgiveness. You know what the Lord showed me right there? It reminded me of the passage where there is this servant choking the little one and pay me everything you owe me. I told my wife right there, you know what? For 20 years we've been working at this and this hasn't changed. What happens to leave everything behind and forgiven before the sun sets and all that stuff? I realize I thought I was being the good guy by making sure everything is addressed, but I was not forgiving my wife regularly. Whether she has forgiveness or not, forgiveness is for you and I to release this malice from our heart. It's for us to sit at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross saying, Lord, you are the judge. I'm not the judge. I need to release it. So <sighs> I ask for forgiveness. And forgiveness, when you ask for forgiveness, is not just, sorry. No. You apologize, right, right? Please forgive me because I've done A, B, and C. And so the Lord put me through the mill. And that's what Peter is talking about right here. If you are going to make it into God's family and grow for him, if you're going to leave this salvation, no malice, no deceit, no hypocrisy, you got to be who you truly are in him, not envy or slander. 
The way you talk, the way you treat each other, your emotions, your ways of thinking, everything has to point to a new beginning, a new reality. What reality? Verse 2 says, you have been born again. You're like newborn infants. When God calls you to salvation, you are born again to the reality of the new life of Christ. And as a newborn infant, you got to grow, it says, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. This spiritual milk is the word of God. This is the food of the word of God. You and I, when we are called to sanctification, we are going to need the word of God in our hearts. Otherwise, we're not going to live holy lives. So when you're a baby, when you're a new believer, the first and most important priority of your life is your relationship with God as you feed on his word. Because when you feed on the Bible, on the written word of God, you really are feeding on Jesus Christ, the living word. He's going to teach you how to think because you know what? This word is going to renew your mind. But here's a tragic thing. Not only is the spiritual milk important for us to grow, look at what it says in verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, Peter is going to start quoting the Old Testament to see if you really are following with him. Let me ask you this, church family. When he's saying, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, where is that from? That's right. Psalms. If you look in your bottom footnotes of your Bible, if you have references, it's going to tell you Psalm 34. If you go and check out Psalm 34, when you get a chance, read the whole Psalm. Psalm 34 is about God's presence in the midst of his people when they are experiencing trials and persecution. And in Psalm 34, the psalmist is saying, when you really have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you don't want anything else. When you feed on him, this world is like eating cardboard. Even if you're suffering, he's worth living and dying for because there's nothing better than him. His word is better than gold. His word is better than honey. Way better. There's nothing that compares with him. But if you've never tasted the Lord, if he's just an intellectual exercise, you don't know what you don't know. But if you do know, you want his word now. Here's, here's a scary thing. How many people in the average church in the United States and the world, go to church week after week, but they don't feed on their own. Now, in the United States, we have more Bibles than we regularly use, and you have it on your phone, and you can even listen to it. In this church, we have the Remain Journal, right? You can listen to your Bible every day of your life. And yet, even though it's so convenient, many of us don't feed on the Word like newborn infants. Now, how often do newborn infants want to eat? Oh, gosh. Thank you. Clearly a mom with experience, right? Every two hours. But thankfully, at night, they give you a break. Those newborns want to eat all the time. It's kind of like you and I reading our Bible, right? We go work out and, oh my goodness, I haven't read my Bible for an hour. I need to come read it. If we are not that hungry for the Word, something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with us. And you know what's wrong with us? That we're way too entertained. And you come to the Bible, it's like, why is it not switching? It's a book. There are no screens in a book. You cannot click it. You have to read it. To read it? Yeah. Well, that's, that's crazy. The Bible is not to entertain you. It's to challenge you, to nourish you, to engage you, to reveal the author so that you can enter into a world that you cannot control. You are the mercy of God. He's going to feed you so that you may grow up for salvation. Several passages that you can look at later on. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to 6-3. The author of Hebrews tells them, listen, we have so many things to say and it is difficult to explain because you have become people of heavy ears, hard of hearing, hard of hearing. You should already be Teachers, you should know all this stuff, but you have the need after so long to teach you all the basics of your Christian walk. You, don't, you cannot eat at stake. I need to give you a bottle with milk again. Now, nothing wrong if you are a newborn Christian, right? If you're a baby, babies drink milk, and that's all they can drink at that point. That's it. But if you're a 35-year-old man, 45-year-old man, and you come, my baggy mommy, I want my bottle. Now, that's a problem, right? That's a problem. If you've been in the church forever, 
and you haven't committed to Jesus Christ, I'm thinking about baptism. I don't think it's the time yet. No, your time has passed already. Long time ago, it was your time to commit. Well, I'm not sure if I should be serving. At... Seriously? If you are saved, you're going to bear fruits. And if there's no fruit, the question is, are you saved? Because you may not be. Paul told the Corinthians, I'm not being rude. Paul told the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Or you don't know yourself unless you are not approved, unless you fail the test. That's a scary thing. When you don't want to read your Bible, when you don't want to pray, you may not be saved. First analogy then is this. You need to refine your taste. To crave, to desire what God desires. You need to feed on what God provides for you, not what the world gives you. No more chips at night. Get some cantaloupe. No, I don't like fruit. It's good for you. Okay, keep eating your chips until your blood pressure skyrockets, and then you need to have on top of your medicine your cantaloupe. Don't wait for correction. Learn by instruction. Otherwise, your counselor is going to tell you you're the problem, and that's not fun, right? So first thing, refine your test. Second analogy, right there in verse, verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sign of God chosen and precious, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For he stands in scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense." So here's your second thing. God wants us to rebuild our lives on Jesus Christ in spite of the world's rejection. Not only do you become a believer already saved that wants to feed on the word, but now you build your life on Jesus Christ. Beautiful passage that Peter is telling us right here. By the way, those verses that he's quoting right here, uh, um, if indeed you have, uh, excuse me, a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of God chosen precious, in verse 4, that is from Psalm 118.22. Jesus references this passage in Mark 12, 1 through 12, when he's talking to his disciples about how he came to save people and people rejected him. Even the religious people rejected him. And Jesus says, you know what? It's interesting. Psalm 118 is a psalm that anticipates the coming of Messiah. This is a psalm that we read when we do Palm Sunday. Hosanna, son of David, save us. The king came to save his son but his son rejected him. You know why? Because to accept and receive Jesus and to build your life on him necessarily means that you will reject the world. And when you reject the world, the world will reject you. Jesus said, if you were from the world, the world would love you because the, love, the world loves its own, but I chose you from the world. The world will hate you. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will need to learn to belong with him and with those that belong to him. And that is a tough thing. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, several things are going to happen. First, you will realize, verse 5, that you are a living stone. What does that mean? Well, Christ is the foundation of a new humanity. He is the stone that the builders rejected, but that God appointed and there is a whole building that God is building on this, a new humanity. It is the church. The analogy is the church is like a building. Now, just, you see me out. You know churches are not buildings, right? Churches are communities of followers of Jesus Christ. But the analogy that Peter is giving us is like Jesus is the foundation and you and I fitting with him and with his people. So we're built on each other and we need each other to be what God has called us to be. God has a blueprint and in this blueprint, hear me out, everyone counts. Every one of his people that he's been calling and transforming. When you are on your own, you're like, uh, I don't know what the purpose of my life is. Because your life and my life make sense as followers of Jesus Christ in community. I don't care how beautiful you are. Maybe you're a beautiful stained glass window. But by yourself, you're just a decoration. But in the building and this community, not only are you beautiful, you're functional too. You're part of a community that God is building. And that's what Peter is saying right here. To be sanctified is to be set apart 
to be God's community where God dwells. God wants to dwell individually in every one of us by Holy Spirit, but also in community. Jesus makes himself known by the many faces, talents, and personalities of his family. We are a holy priesthood. A priest is somebody that has access to God and represents God before the people and the people before God. You're God's representative in this fallen world. But guess what? That is going to cost you. What's it going to cost you? Your life. Now, when I'm saying it's going to cost you your life, I'm not meaning, oh, there's nothing but death ahead of you. No, 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 no. There's nothing but life ahead of you. When you surrender your life, he takes it. He never, ever wastes the suffering of his saints. He takes it as a living sacrifice and makes it way better than this world can ever imagine. And not only that, this world could kill you. It's true. But no one can take away your life because it belongs to Jesus Christ. Even if they kill you, Christ has promised that he's going to bring you back as he came back from the dead in the day of the resurrection. So you're setting him. For other people, he's a stumbling block. But for you, he's the foundation of your life. That's what sanctification is all about. Listen, maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. If he is the foundation of your life, when the storms come, your house will remain. So that's sanctification. But now, here's the best part. When you are committed to Christ because you're saved, when you are little by little dying to self to live for him, carrying your cross and following him, here's the third thing. Not only do you refine your test, rebuild your life, but now God wants to redefine the purpose of our lives as we join Christ in mission. Listen to what God sees when he looks at you and me in Christ. The world may say you're good for nothing, you're a bigoted Christian, whatever they want to say. But look at what God says you and I are in Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession. This right here, is our identity in Christ. Kings and priests. One day Christ told his disciples, you will sit with me in my kingdom, the kingdom of my father, and you will also have a part in this rule. We are kings and priests. By the way, this is exactly what God wanted to make the people of Israel. But they couldn't. Every time they failed. You know what the big difference is? Israel and the church are not the same thing. Because the big difference is that now we have Jesus Christ. And because we have Jesus Christ, he makes all the difference in the world. We are not trying to please God because of our effort. We are pleasing to God because of Jesus' righteousness. We are a holy nation, royal priesthood, holy nation. What does that mean? Well, of course, we're all here Americans, right? Not all of us are Americans. This is a church for all nations and all generations. We have people from all over the world, from China, from India, from Latin America, from all over the world. Well, I thought I was going to an American church. Listen, the church is neither American nor Mexican nor Indian. The church is the body of Christ. But, but we are a people defined in our citizenship by our heavenly calling. Our citizenship is in heaven from where we wait for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to come back. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm grateful, and I appreciate that I have a blue passport. When I travel, I use my blue passport. It's so convenient. But if there is ever a question about my ultimate loyalty, if I had to choose between Jesus Christ or whatever passport, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. There's no competition right there. Our, we are a nation set apart to belong to God. Our loyalty is ultimately to Him, and the time, for the time being, we get to be a Roman to the Romans, a Greek to the Greek, a Jew to the Jew, to win them over for Christ. Now that's when the mission starts making sense. God left us here to represent him as an embassy from heaven, a set-apart people that can represent his kingdom well. When you and I understand that our identity is given by our heavenly calling, then whenever the world wants you to compromise, the answer is clear. We are a holy nation, a people a chosen race, oh gosh, you racist. A chosen family, that's what it means. 
This, is, this has nothing to do with the color of your skin or your DNA. It has everything to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us family. We are his family. People for his own possession. And here's the purpose. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Guys, who are we? We are followers of Jesus Christ called to represent him in this world. What are we here for? To make money. To retire well. To proclaim it. That has to do with your words and your works. To demonstrate the excellencies of he who called us out of darkness into his light. People see you living differently. And they ask you, hey, why? And you tell them, oh, because I go to church. Because I'm a Christian. Because I, eh, that's the wrong way to go. People come to you and say, hey, I notice." And you say, you know what? I'm a mess. I'm a mess just like everybody else, but by the grace of God, I have a Savior that, man, can I tell you about what he did for me? Can I tell you about who he is? Man, he's forgiven. I used to struggle with, and I still struggle with, but God, who is so good, rich in mercy. You know what he did for me? He sent his son. He died for me. He rose on the third day. He forgave me. He's given me a new life. And he's teaching me how to live again. Would you like to know more about him? It's not about religion. It's not about come to my church. It's not about hear this or that podcast. It's about get to know the one who is excellent in every way. We have a message to tell, guys. And we cannot compromise representing this excellent God, either for politics or for cultural controversies. We already have a gospel. We have a message of good news. And it's all about what he has done and who he is. That's it. How tragic it will be that many of us made lots of money and did a lot of things and failed to live up to the purpose of our life, to proclaim the excellencies of he who called us out of darkness into his wonderful life. And by the way, Peter says, remember where you came from. There was a time when you were not a people, and he's quoting from Hosea. You were not a people. You did not know God, but now you are the people of God. You know why? Because of his grace. Because of his grace. Now, get ready to live for him. So let me summarize this for us. We've been talking about becoming disciple makers, right? Here's the turning point, guys. What in the world are we becoming? By the grace of God, I want to believe that DFBC is becoming a church that values deeply what God values. And there are three things, three turning points that you and I cannot afford missing. The first one is a call to salvation. If you're not saved, you need to talk to me. You need to talk to somebody right here in the prayer team. We need to tell you how to trust Jesus Christ, how you can receive eternal life. I'm not telling you how to join this or that church. I'm telling you how to have the assurance of your sins forgiven. You need to know how to do that. Second, maybe you've been flirting with the world. You're a weekend Christian. He wants you all the time, 24-7. Consecration, commitment. When you take the Lord's Supper weekly, you're saying, Lord, I belong to you. I commit to you. If you skip the Lord's Supper just because oh, I'm not ready to commit, you're missing it. Take a turn for him. Tell him, Lord, I want to be holy as you're holy. But what about this sin? Give it up. Bring it at his feet. He'll forgive you. Here's the third thing. Maybe you've been growing. And he has a call for you to serve him. Doing what? I don't know. But he wants you to serve him. Maybe even a vocational calling to ministry. It used to be right that there was an altar call. So you gave your life to the ministry. You give your life to the Lord. Doing ministry. Whether you're a lawyer, a janitor, a pastor, whatever it is, your service is, is ministry. But maybe God is calling you to be a pastor. Or a missionary. Or an evangelist. I don't know. Maybe your calling is inside the church. How long will you flee from this calling? If you are ready to tell him, Lord, I'm all yours. No more flirting. I am all yours. Then you're ready to become a disciple maker. But if not, Christ is calling. 
outside of your door, knocking and saying, let me in. True disciple makers are saved, sanctified, and sent to believe, live, and give God's saving word. Is that you? Because if that's not you, Christ clearly wants you to be everything he sees in you. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for allowing us to come before you. Lord, today um, we proclaim that you are our shield. We proclaim that even though there are enemies surrounding us, you're the one who lifts up our head. We've heard that you are good. And we've, if we've tasted and seen that you're good, we, just, we, we are to desire your word. We are to build our lives on the foundation of Christ. We are to embrace the identity, the way in which you see us, not the world tells us that we are. Lord, but everything in my flesh rebels against your desire sometimes. Sometimes I want what I shouldn't. But Lord, you know me. You search me. You know when I sit. You know when I rise up. You know my thoughts from afar. Lord, try me and know my heart. Lord, see if there is any grievous way in me. Lead me. Lead us in the way everlasting. So as we come to this table, this is a moment of commitment. But if there is someone here that has entrusted you as Savior through your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray they will come to you in faith. But if there's somebody that's struggling with sin or double-minded, Lord, I pray that today will be a day of commitment where we'll renew our vows before you and say, yes, Lord, we choose you because you've chosen us. We say yes to you. We take this bread and this cup. We depend on you. We rely on you. And Lord, maybe you have a calling for somebody here that has been resisting a calling to join you in mission, whether it's serving you in a local church or being sent to the ends of the earth, you will say what that is, Lord. But I pray today will be a day when you call and will say, yes, we answer. This may be our turning point in your direction. Father, thank you.